consumer protection, consumer credit transactions is actually what I think the title is in the chapter of, of the book. Uh, the chapter in the book for this section of reading is a bit narrow. It's really limited to the credit transactions, and it's more of an introduction into the next section we're going to be discussing, which is secure transactions. I'm going to expand this uh, area a little bit further and call it consumer protection and laws and regulations related to consumer uh, transactions. So consumer protection laws, what do they do? They ensure the operation of an efficient marketplace. And we have the Federal Trade Commission. That kind of is the driving force, the federal agency that protects consumers. It does protect businesses as well, but its main mission is to protect consumers. And generally, their job is to regulate unfair or deceptive acts or practices. However, under this Federal Trade Act and Trade Commission are a number of different bureaus or commissions that then develop other areas uh, of law regulating consumer transactions and consumer credit and consumer protections. The main ones we're going to focus on uh, is equal, the Equal uh, Credit Opportunity Act, the Truth and Lending Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and at the end I have a few others that I'm just going to flag in there. I'm sure you're familiar with or heard of them before. Uh, deceptive and false advertising. This is the area where our Federal Trade Commission comes in. And before I, I jump into this area specifically, with regards to the regulations that I was pointing out, in addition to federal protections, there are also state uh, statutes and agency that uh, have rules covering those protections as well. So there might be a violation at the federal level as well as the state level. Uh, when the federal is involved, uh, we're looking and talking about the Federal Trade Commission or the governing body that falls under that agency. And for states, when states are um, investigating, let's say, deceptive false uh, advertising or fair credit practices, it's the attorney general that will um, be the driving force behind that. But I'll talk more about enforcement a little later. So deceptive false advertising. If a firm makes a false claim about, uh, I don't know, an ex inexpensive home good, the consumer could sue, right? Could consumer can sue for fraud. But how much time would that take and how much money and how much effort would it really be worth it, right? So when we have the agency come in, they bring a claim on behalf of all of those who may be defrauded by that inexpensive home good. And what that agency is looking at the standard is they, to determine whether or not a deception has taken place. To determine deception, I'll say the Federal Trade Commission in my example, uh, they look for or looks at the ad from the point of view of the reasonable consumer. And there's that reasonable person again, right? Uh, what a typical person looking at that ad would review that. And in, in the, they consider the ad context, the whole, not just what the word, certain focusing on certain words, they're going to ask what does it convey to the consumer, the reasonable consumer. So take for example, ABC mouthwash. Uh, ABC mouthwash prevents colds. That's the message, right? That's what they're saying. ABC mouthwash prevents colds. And in my second example, we have ABC mouthwash kills the germs that causes colds. So what are we looking at in both of these examples? What's the message? That the product prevents colds. In the first one, they say it. ABC mouthwash prevents colds. So if you're going to buy ABC mouthwash, you're hoping that it will clear up the cold that you may have. And in the second example, ABC mouthwash kills the germs that causes colds. It may not actually say it that it prevents colds as it does in the first example, but it's implicit. So the point is, these ads, uh, deception could be expressed or it could be implied. You have to look at the context and what's the message being conveyed. And in here, that the product prevents colds. And the rule here is that the advertiser must prove, they must have proof to back up their claims. If they can't prove that their mouthwash prevents cold, then there's a huge problem, okay?
Um, and I just want to throw out a, an example, a very big uh, example with regards to the Federal Trade Commission and uh, reviewing and how, how claims come to, come to head. I don't know if you're familiar with the Volkswagen issue with their diesel engine. They claim that their cars, uh, their di diesel engine cars were minimizing pollution from 2008 to 2015. Volkswagen Group of America sold cars with diesel engines that supposedly engineered to minimize pollution, maximizing their performance and comply with U.S. government regulations. These vehicles were promoted as clean diesel cars, quote unquote, clean diesel cars. And I will tell you, I, I want to share this example because this kind of hits home because I bought a Volkswagen for the purpose of, hey, it's got clean diesel and I was going to get good gas mileage. So, yeah, I was I was sold on their advertisement. And so that's how they sold it. However, unbeknownst to consumers and regulators, Volkswagen had installed illegally a cheat software in its car to fool emissions testers. The software could sense that a car was being tested and it would turn on emissions reduction technology to comply with pollution standards. When driving under normal conditions, however, the emissions controls would be significantly reduced, increasing performance and gas mileage, but producing up to 40 times as much pollution. And uh, this votes, this, it went from 2008 to 2015. Their deception was discovered, not by regulators, but by students, by graduate students from the uh, West Virginia University. They were working at its Center for Alternative Fuels, Engines, and Emissions. Eventually, re regulators responded to the students' evidence and publicity exposing VW's actions. Uh, consumers who purchased the illegal equipped uh, vehicles discovered they were deceived by those promises of the clean diesel. Uh, the resale value of the cars plummeted, and guess what? Volkswagen was sued by everybody. They were sued by the Federal Trade Commission, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the California Attorney General, the California Air Sources Board, and current and former owners of VW. Uh, Volkswagen vehicles and settlements uh, took place and well all, over 11.5 billion dollars in compensation repair and buyback options and they also the FTC also obtained an injunction remember what that was injunction a court order stopping Volkswagen from using any sort of cheat devices or making deceptive statements about environmental benefits in the future so that was a big, uh, a big case. It did hit home, and um, I certainly was part of the class action lawsuit and got a bit of uh, recourse. Uh, but anyway, so these things, these things happen. That is a big, that is a big thing. So false and deceptive practices. Back to uh, slides here. How do I? Uh, how do false and deceptive practices arise? They arise in many forms. They may arise from a false statement uh, about a company's product. It could be a false statement about a competitor or their product. It could be statements regarding their own quality, uh, product's quality, effects, price, origin, availability. Advertisements that have uh, half-truths, meaning that the presented information is true but incomplete if it leads consumers to false conclusions. Ads that contain celebrity endorsements may be deemed deceptive if the celebrity doesn't actually use the product. Uh, product. Ads based on factual evidence, but in fact, not that the uh, it's not reasonably supported by some evidence, will be deemed deceptive. Some, uh, so in these cases, how about I'm going to give you an example. How about this for an example? Tell me if this is a deceptive ad, ad or not, or think about it, and I'll tell you. Teak Tables posts an online ad on several furniture retailers' websites. The ad refers to the firm's wide selection of custom tables. So uh, Teak Tables posts uh, an online ad, and it runs on several furniture retailers' websites. And the ad refers to the firm's wide selection of custom tables. Is this ad deceptive in any way? The answer is yes, it actually is. If you're familiar with, um, or if you uh, 
are someone who prefers a certain kind of table be made uh, with a certain product. If uh, the ad does not mention that most of Teak's tables are made from oak, is that a problem? I, I should tell you if you're not familiar, Teak, T-E-A-K, Teak is a type of wood, Teak wood. So now that you know that, if you didn't know that before, Teak tables, posts and online. Now does this look deceptive to you? Isn't the uh, implication is that teak tables makes tables out of teak wood and if the ad if they don't maybe if they make most of their tables out of oak then that's a deceptive ad because your name is teak tables and you don't say otherwise and if uh, I'm someone who likes teak wood and I want to buy a table made out of teak wood I might go to teak tables based on this ad so that is an example of a deceptive, implicitly deceptive uh, ad. Uh, Snapchat got dinged from the Federal Trade Commission. If you're familiar with Snapchat or use chap Snapchat, the only, I don't use Snapchat, but the only thing that I'm aware of of Snapchat is that you get the message and then it's supposed to disappear forever. That was their, that was their big pitch, right? But that was not the case. That was the deceptive advertising. And that's what I knew about Snapchat. So their deceptive marketing got them dinged along with another violating privacy issues and, and accessing people, people's privacy uh, information with their app. But more importantly, with their phone messages, is that we said that the phone messages people send on its services, quote unquote, disappear forever. That wasn't the case after complaints uh, that the FTC received. The videos sent through Snapchat were easily accessible by the recipient by plugging a phone into a computer, even though such videos are supposed to disappear in seconds. The complaint also claimed that the iPhone users could actually take an, a screenshot of the photo that they had received without alerting the sender that the screen cap was taken, the screenshot was taken. So. It's not deleted forever if there's another way that uh, it can be uh, obtained. So they got dinged. So how does this all happen? How does the Federal Trade Commission stop deception or any other violations of uh, agency laws? How it all works. The it, this is the administrative uh, proceeding aspect of when we were talking about sources of laws and when we have uh, admitted administrative orders, they come from administrative agencies. That's what our friends at the FTC are. They don't bring a court case. You know, it could get there. But in this instance, um, what they do is how they, how it comes about is they get complaints, right? If you think of an ad as, if you think an ad, if you think an ad is deceptive and you report it to the agency, but yours is the only complaint that comes in, nothing's going to happen, right? So they have to get some sort of widespread complaint, possibly from various sources, or it's publicly being complained about our VW uh, case that I just told you about, but they can come in from various sources, consumers, businesses, the Better Business Bureau, different government uh, agencies, and in the Volkswagen case, it came from students doing research. So once they get uh, a, what they believe is a valid number of complaints, they conduct their own investigation. And if they believe that false or deceptive practices has occurred, they send the offender a formal complaint. And the company may stop on its own, and say, yep, you're right, and stop, and nothing further happens, or there may be, and some agreement is reached, or there may be a hearing, and the hearing happens at the Federal Trade Commission. They'll have an administrative uh, judge hear the case. And what the agency determines, if they determine that a false or deceptive practice happens, they issue what's called a cease and desist order, which is kind of like our court injunction, but it's a cease and desist that you stop, or they may require... Uh, the uh, offender to make a new ad correcting the old ad. They can make them do that, and they can certainly, like I said, tell them to stop doing what they're doing. And if the offender does not like the outcome, then they will proceed to court for an appeal, and then uh, the FTC can 
look for an injunction at that point. So that's where it all starts. It starts at the agency level. Now, what about, oh, and here it is. That's the process. Widespread complaints. They do an investigation. They have a hearing. And if they win, cease and desist, possibly make a new ad. And then the appeal process, should the offender want to uh, carry it on. Credit protection. We have various rules regarding credit protection. Why credit protection? Just like the deceptive advertising, the Federal Trade Commission can bring action against those who violate statutes governing credit protections. But why credit protections? We have them because of the extension of credit in this economy. It's so important that we have to have some control. There has to be some regulation or it will just run, run amok and people will get taken advantage of. So it's not surprising that we have all of these laws regarding credit extension. And the first big one is our Truth in Lending Act. And this is to ensure meaningful disclosure of credit terms so that the consumer will be able to compare more readily the various credit terms available to him or her and avoid the uninformed use of credit. So it's a disclosure law. It allows consumers to shop around for the best financing arrangements. This imposes a duty on all persons who regularly extend credit to private individuals to inform them fully of the cost of credit. So how does, it, how does this law, who does this law apply to? The lender in a business of extending credit. So this could be a bank, could be mortgage lenders, could be credit card companies. And it involves things like a loan of money. You need money to uh, pay for, I don't know, a home, home improvement. Uh, it could be a transaction involving property. Could be a transaction involving a car. Could be any sort of personal property. Could be an ATV, if you're going to buy an ATV on credit. So if it, the business is in the business of lending money or extending credit, then this law applies to them. Now, who's our debtor? Actually, let me flip to mine. So the disclosure needs to be the banks, the mortgage lenders, the credit card companies, those lenders have to disclose to a natural person. And this is distinguished from a corporation or a business entity. The, the act does not apply to uh, disclosure involving uh, lending money to a corporation or a business. It has to be an individual, a natural person. And the lease or loan that is being sought has to have at least four installment payments or more for the disclosure to apply. And the disclosure, the key to accomplishing this full disclosure, are namely through these two things, the finance charge and the annual percentage rate. Um, our finance charge is the collection of all of the costs of getting the loan. If you're buying a house, it's going to be things like the appraisal, um, whatever the total interest is going to be. Uh, you may have an application fee, but w whatever it is, it's the total amount that it's going to cost you to get this loan, the finance charge. The annual percentage rate is the cost of your credit as a, a yearly rate. And I have some forms on Moodle. I have a truth and lender disclosure form. I have a real estate uh, uh, closure, disclosure of a closing for a real estate. And I have the UCC's financial statement. And this is the financial statement is the document that's given before credit uh, is extended, OK? and. The two documents, besides, you'll notice the truth in lending statement document. And then the difference between the disclosure of closure, that relates to a uh, transaction involving real estate. And the financial statement is something uh, that you use if it's not real estate, if you're going to buy a car, so to speak. That's the financial statement given before credit can be extended. That's how these things are uh, provided to the consumer. And they have to show you not only the finance charges and the annual percentage rate, but also the default delinquency charges if you do not pay the loan, uh, the description of any property used as security, so if it's a car, 
then they're going to have the car has the security. If it's a home, they're going to have the home as the security. And they have to tell you the total amount financed, which is the grand total of how much you're going to spend all together with the borrowed loan and the finance charges. And if you look at the documents, you can uh, see uh, where those numbers come into play. I'm not going to test you on the numbers. I'm just going to test you on this information. But it's nice to actually see it as we're talking about it. And what happens if uh, there's a failure to disclose? The one failing to disclose is subject to penalties for noncompliance, and they could be in the form of civil or criminal penalties. In the end, the borrower uh, could get actual damages. They can uh, rescind the contract. And uh, for an example, I, and I'm sure you guys remember way back when, 2008, the Housing dropped because of these subprime mortgages. This is a prime example where the truth in lending was totally non complied with. Uh, the subprime mortgages, they refer, as if you're not familiar with subprime mortgages, they refer to mortgage, uh, mortgages, uh, security loans for consumers who do not qualify for ordinary market rates of interest because they do not have creditworthiness, right? So they, they're kind of risky. So it means that their income's not high enough or it, you know, certain enough not to qualify under ordinary circumstances. So they give these subprime mortgages. And during the 1990s and early 2000s, the house prices nationally were going up and up and up. And many of the banks and other financial institutions, that was encouraged by the government, by the way, became willing to loan money to consumers who ordinarily would not qualify for particular loans because rising house prices made the mortgage securities quite sound. If consumers became unable to pay monthly loan rates, they found it easy to renegotiate lower rates because of the soundness of the mortgages and the um, equity that was, provi that was get provided in the rising house values. Uh, and then when the housing bubble burst, and in many parts of the country, house values stopped rising, disaster in that subprime market, which by 2007 by, was estimated at $1.3 trillion. Uh, many consumers became unable to pay their loans and the lenders were unwilling to lower mortgage repayments because the house prices were no longer rising and then foreclosure took off. So um, the consumers uh, with their adjustable rate mortgages were the hardest hit because the interest rates became uh, higher, which means their monthly payments did so as well. And then, of course, the economic effects rippled through the economy, and then we went into the recession. But lawyers representing consumers with the mortgages and the foreclosures were turning to the Truth in Lending Act and sued many of the lenders who had not complied with all of the complications uh, and provisions of the act. So what happened, what you'll see, in those documents is really a, a tweaking. If I had documents, and I, I don't have documents, from prior to this incident, they were a lot less structured than what they look like right now in, in front of you if you're looking at them. So, and that was, this was the reason for uh, that. And I also will note before we switch to the next act is the Truth in Lending Act provides protection for credit card holders as well. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of those that might actually believe there's a section in the book on it. But for purposes of, of this, uh, the protections are when it comes to interest rates. Um, uh, they have to fully disclose their uh, interest rates and what happens when you do not pay uh, your card. Maybe you have a 0% interest rate unless you miss a payment for one month and then it climbs up to some outrageous amount like 21%. You have to be notified. There's also provisions on when you are sent an unsolicited card and also regulations related to unauthorized charges and hence the reason why we get phone calls uh, when there's a uh, charge that's not that's speculative or it looks like something that you wouldn't charge uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit more because there's another act that comes into play with regards to id theft so our next act is the equal credit opportunity act this is to prevent discrimination in credit extension back in the old days before 1975. That's when this act was created. Um, banks could and did require women to have their husband sign uh, signatures on a loan despite being able to pass their credit checks. 
That's no longer. This, is, uh, this prevents discrimination and credit extension based on sex, rate, age, race, religion, national origin, marital status, and if you receive uh, welfare payments. So this act applies to all businesses which regularly extend credit, but not only that, it also applies to folks like automobile dealers, real estate brokers, and others who steer, steer uh, consumers to lenders. So if you know, you're going to buy a car, the dealer is going to have a partner that they extend, uh, a lender that, that would extend credit to setting up the loans or helps find a lender. Same thing with real estate brokers. So if uh, you regularly extend credit or you help consumers find lenders, this act applies to you. Then we have the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and this regulates the consumer credit reporting industry. Every year in the United States, the credit reporting industry issues twice as many credit reports as there are people in the country. So that's, uh, that's pretty big. What's a, what's a credit report? Have you guys gotten a uh, credit report? They're free now, once a year. It's a detailed report of one's credit history, and it's prepared by a credit bureau. We have three main ones, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Any one of those agencies will give you a um, free credit report. Actually, all three. You can contact all three. You can do it once a year. These reports cover not only consumers seeking credit, but also persons you know might be seeking a job, or you might be seeking insurance, or you may seek housing. Uh, your credit report can be looked at or reviewed. So who does it protect? The act protect, protects against inaccuracies uh, of the credit report. So if you get a copy of your credit report and there's something that, on there that's not accurate or you get declined a job or insurance or housing due to an inaccurate credit report, you actually have some rights. And what are they? You have the right to know which agency, reporting agency, provided the report with the inaccurate information on it. You have the right to the information in the report. And you have the right to correct the information or allow, uh, you're, you're allowed to dispute the facts in there uh, with regards to the inaccuracy. Usually what happens is when you authorize your because you have to consent to access of your report. So once you authorize it, if you're going to get a loan, they say, you know, the lender has to say, well, we have to access your credit report, sign here. And you do, when they run your credit report, you get it, whether there's a problem with it or not, you actually, the lender gives you the copy. It says that we ran it from uh, TransUnion. Here is the report. If there's anything on it that flags their interest, they will tell you and they will show it to you. And then you have the ability to contact TransUnion and correct it um, or explain your side. Usually if you're explaining your side, the lender is going to require you to correct it or provide written proof. Uh, no one, like I said, no one can access your credit without your consent. And Every time, just a note here, every time you, and the reason for that, one, it's privacy issues, but number two, every time your history is obtained, it lowers your score. So you want to make sure you are uh, in charge of who can access your information. So consumer, I'm going to read you a real case, Comcast Corporation provides internet service. Comcast requires a $50 deposit from any customer who wishes to open an account and avoid a credit inquiry. Mr. Santiago, a Comcast customer, decided to pay the $50 deposit instead of having Comcast run a credit history. Despite this choice and without his authorization, Comcast pulled his credit record. This Comcast inquiry further lowered his credit store. He filed a complaint in federal district court against Comcast alleging a violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And Comcast filed a motion to dismiss. Did Comcast violate the act by pulling Santiago's credit report? Yes, they found he did. So they denied the motion to dismiss. The court noted that 
The act grants consumers a legally protected interest in limiting access to their credit reports and provides redress for violations. So they, he, was allowed to, he was allowed to have his case continued, whether he won anything uh, or not, I don't know, but uh, he was allowed to move forward on his case. So failure to comply, a civil violation, can recover some damages. Maybe he was denied a loan due to the fact that Comcast hit the inquiry that lowered his rate. That could be it. But in any event, recover damages, could recover attorney's fees. And if Comcast was really uh, willful about it, maybe they've done it in the past to many other folks, they can be dinged for punitive damages. Then we have the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And, you know, this is to prevent debt collection agencies from using abusive and deceptive collection practices. And while, it's, while extending credit is important in the economy, so is the collection of the debt. So, you know, for whatever reason, people stop paying, whether they're overextended or they lost their job or they became ill, the debt is out there and it has to be repaid or collection agencies attempt to repay get that repaid and there's thousands and thousands of collection agencies out there attorneys also act as collection agencies they can they can collect uh, debts too. the IRS is a collection agency and that's who this law applies to any business that is attempting to collect a debt as long as it's not the actual creditor so if you owe me money maybe you hired me to be your lawyer and uh, you didn't pay my fee, so I turned it over to a collection agency, and they came knocking on the door. That's who this law applies to. Now, if I tried to collect it on my own, I'm the creditor. I'm the one who's owed the debt, so I have to uh, go. This law doesn't apply to me, okay? So how does this work? We have, oh, before I tell you how it works, one more note. It's on the bottom of the slide before I switch. This covers consumer debt only. So it's consumer debt. And this is what the list of prohibited acts that are set forth in the Federal Statute of Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And I'll note that the state laws have a ton of their own uh, rules regarding uh, abusive tactics and I'll tell you a couple of uh, the New York ones that are a little different from this. I also put on Moodle the laws regulating uh, the debt collection in New York State if you wanted to take a look. So the act covers like I said consumer debt and these are the things that you cannot be subject to as a debtor. Physical threatening behavior, physical threat of the debt Debtor, use of obscene language. If the agency is representing themselves as an attorney and they are not an attorney, that cannot happen. Uh, you can't threaten the debtor with arrest or garnishment unless the collector can legally take action and intends to do so. Number one, I'm just going to kind of reaffirm this. You cannot be arrested for not paying a debt. So that can't happen. And so that would be a lie. And garnishment, to tell you what gar garnishment is, I know it's in the book, but I'll explain it here. Garnishment is when the creditor seeks to ask your employer to take money out of your paycheck to um, pay for the outstanding debt. But that cannot happen unless the collect. I should have said the, the creditor, not the debtor, when the creditor wants to take money out of your paycheck to pay off, yeah, to pay off the debt. That cannot happen without a court order, so they will have to go through the court action first to get a piece of paper that allows them to do so. Failure to disclose the identity as a collector. They can't telephone you before 8 a.m., and they can't call you after 9 p.m. They can't repeatedly call you with annoying calls every five minutes, every five minutes. What they do have to do, oh, a few others, uh, Place collect calls, they can't uh, call you collect, and they can't use uh, unfair or unconscionable means to collect the debt. They cannot 
contact employment if the employer objects and they can't cannot contact third parties about the debtors, like they can't call your neighbors and they can't call your parents and they can't call your friends unless the court allows it. They can't pose as a police officer. Uh, communication with the debtor they cannot have after they've received written notice from you saying they don't want you to contact them. Accept this notice, okay? And uh, this is a validation notice. It's a written communication that you receive from the agency collection agency it goes to the debtor indicating that they have the debtor has 30 days to dispute the debt and request verification you also get this letter probably within five days of any sort of initial contact you may get a phone call if you're a debtor so just to stop here you get a written notification from a collection agency that informs you that you have 30 days to challenge the debt and request verification that's it the refusal, your refusal of the debt does not have to be in writing, but if you want verification, which means it outlines, it gives you the copy of the contract that you sign, all the payments that you made, uh, that says this is how we get to this number of what you owe us, that request must be in writing, okay? Uh, some other side note things before I get into uh, an example. I wanna tell you about New York, a couple of additional Prohibited acts in New York, spoofing calls, using that, uh, you know, that caller ID and they spoof you with uh, numbers that they, they cannot do that. And also in New York, and I think it's pretty standard at every other um, state, but any, notif any written document that you receive from a collection agency or a debt collector, or every time you call a debt collection agency, you have to hear some language that says this is an attempt to collect a debt. So there has to be some uh, initial disclosure of them as a collection agency. And then, like I said, states have their own practices and they differ from state to state, state to state, and collection agencies must know that if they're crossing state lines. If there is a collection agency in Michigan trying to collect uh, a debtor, you know, a uh, a debt from a debtor who was in Michigan at the time and has moved to New York, and now they know that they're in New York, they have to use New York laws to enforce their contract if they're going to attempt to get uh, their payment. So, Roma borrows $200,000 from suburban mortgages to buy a house. Roma defaults on the payments. On Suburban's behalf, Cash Out Collection Agency initiates a foreclosure. Roma receives a notice stating that the debt to Suburban is assumed valid unless she disputes in writing. Roma objects. Was there any violation of this act? There was. By telling Roma that she could dispute the debt only in writing. There is no such requirement. She can dispute it any way she wants. She can call them up on the phone. Writing's probably the best because now you have it documented, but uh, you don't have to. Just your request for verification. And the enforcement of this act, if uh, collection agencies are in violation of this act, unfortunately, only the government agency can seek action against them, not you. You can't sue the collection agency for violating these laws. So in New York State, that would be the Attorney General. Other acts of interest that you should know about or be aware of, we have the Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act. This is the one that combats identity theft. National fraud, there's a national fraud alert system so that consumers who suspect that they have been or may have been victimized by ID theft, they can place an alert on their credit files. So um, the credit reporters will know, the credit agencies that we talked about. Uh, and then this requires credit agencies to give, this is where the, the law came in that requires those credit agencies to give you free credit reports annually to people so people can keep track of their um, identity. Uh, numbers on credit cards can't be printed out on receipts. You can't include the entire credit card on receipts anymore. That's where this has happened. Um, and the fraud alert system, that's as I just said, that allows consumers to um, put themselves on, a, on an alert list. I think the next one here is important because we were talking about warranties. Uh, the Magnuson, Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. 
Uh, this applies to all product warranties on consumer products costing more than $15. Uh, must be identified, the warranty must be identified as full or limited. It has to say those words. This is a full wa uh, warranty or a limited uh, warranty, which means it has some disclaimers. And if it is a full warranty, the seller must repair or replace a defective product within a reasonable time and at no charge to the uh, consumer. No charge to the consumer, and that includes any shipping costs. And any such limitation, so if there's a limited uh, warranty, so any limits, any limitations, they must be disclosed fully and obviously, or conspicuously, and readily understood. So it has to be very big and bold in capital letters. That's how most warranties are. But they have to be identified as full or limited. And then we have the Consumer Product Safety Act. This protects from unreasonable risk of injury from hazardous products, can order, um, the commission can order the removal of products. Uh, they can require issuing of recall notices. They can ban products. Uh, this happens regularly, recall notice. I just actually got a recall notice on the uh, airbag in the passenger side of my 2010 Subaru. I just got a notice saying that they're recalling it, that that airbag doesn't work. Well, it was a good thing that in the last 10 years or so, I haven't gotten into a car accident. Um, but yeah, there's, there's always recar uh, recalls. I've seen them on car seats. I've seen them on bike helmets. But this is the act that allows them to do that. Banning products way back in the day, Coca-Cola uh, had some traces of cocaine in it. That was uh, flagged uh, as an unsafe product. And uh, an example I have here, ViewClear Incorporated makes and sells digital video recorders that can severely overheat when it has been charged. This poses a burn threat to consumers who use the DVR. It may damage their property. If this, uh, if this item hits the market, the commission can do what? They can remove it or they can require it to be repaired to make it safe, but they can remove it and they can ban it. Then we have the Federal Food, Drug, and Com Cosmetic Act. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. The Food and Drug Administration uh, oversees uh, and protects consumers against tainted and misbranded foods and drugs. They establish the food standards. They specify the safe levels of potentially hazardous food additives. They ensure that drugs uh, are safe and effective before marketed to the public. So, And that's the same with medical devices as well. And that's governed by the... Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And then we have the Labeling and Packaging Act laws. And these are actually federal and state. And they require informative labels and warnings to be on, given, uh, on a given number of uh, various products. So the types of labeling that can happen on a product, the identity or the, uh, yeah, the identity of the country where clothing is made, that's a requirement. Uh, nutritional amounts of uh, that are packaged on packaged foods, all those nutrition uh, things that we see on the, uh, the nutrition information we see on the packages of food, that's under these laws. Surgeon General's warnings on cigarettes, that's all under these laws. Or maybe you've seen uh, some of my favorite warnings on, on products. Every product has a warning if you look close enough. Um, but you'll see them, like for example, let's say you have an allergy to nuts. You're looking at products to make sure there's no nuts in the, uh, in the product. And there's actually a requirement or a law because of uh, allergies and nut allergies that if your product contains nuts, you actually have to have a notification on it. But that's where all of those things come from in labeling and packaging uh, different types of uh, foods and products to us is under the labeling and packaging laws, uh, the federal and state governments. So that. Uh, concludes consumer laws. We're going to switch into secure transactions next time.